Hello folks and welcome to a review of Bard's Tale 4 Borrows Deep. An actual scripted and planned review so hopefully it'll be much less rambly and I won't repeat myself repeatedly. Right off the bat you probably notice that the footage we're seeing is me creating a character and starting a brand new game. This is because of one of the big problems I have with this game. Without getting too deep into spoilers, those will come later, before the final quest, you hit a point of no return. The game helpfully gives you a pop-up telling you this fact. What the game doesn't do is give you a hard save. Remember Fallout New Vegas when you were about to raid the Hoover Dam? It also gave you a pop-up warning, but in addition to that, it gave you a hard system save, so you could easily go back to that point after beating the game and, you know, do side quests or whatever. Barrow's Deep doesn't do that. So, long story slightly shorter, the only save games I have for my end game party is in the actual end game. So, sadly, there will be no walking around mostly empty areas to show off the pretty scenery, because once you're locked into the end game, you're locked into the end game. Okay, that was a kind of negative opening, and that's not really my goal. I want to be fair here, but that save issue really bothered me. So let's talk about something nice, like the music. The music is just great. Uh, I'm a real sucker for that sort of thing which might color my opinion. Enya, Lorena McKinnick, Nickel Creek, Leahy, all that stuff. E even the music that we hear over and over again, like the exploration tunes, like Heidi Bide, are well done and keep from getting annoying, which is possibly the most difficult thing to do when scoring a game. A plus, guys. I love it. I think what I'll do for the rest of this review is go over the major quests, then talk about the combat, and then some bugs, and finally wrap up with lore, faithfulness to the series, and my final thoughts. Sound good? Alright, let's get into it. So we're going to start with quests. The major beats here are we've got an intro slash tutorial quest, and then Mangar, Legoth Xanta, Tarjan, Harrenhold, and the Endgame. Right off the top, you may have noticed a slight issue here, specifically that the plot of this game is very much trying to be a greatest hit sort of thing, but that does have its own problems. Uh, it has a lot of problems. I'll get more into it in the lore section, but a video game series isn't a side-scrolling beat-em-up. We really don't want to see major bosses recycled into mini-bosses later in the series. And hey, if we're going to do that, why no Calais? <clears throat> Alright, back on topic here, the intro quest. As far as intro quests go, it's really not too bad. The very beginning is a little on the lawn side, but it does do a very good job of introducing you to movement, quests, combat, exploration songs, and if you kept Melody or made a bard, it provides an easy introduction to every class in the game, as well as the major races. Frankly, it's pretty solidly crafted, and I can't complain too much about it. The only thing I'd bring up is that some of the exploration songs are much less useful than the others. Jarnenel's Eyes is almost entirely useless, even in the quest designed around it. A couple others have somewhat limited use, but Jarnenel's Eyes feels like it was shoved into the game because every new NPC must add a song. At the end of this quest, you're asked to send a character off to do something. Uh, I, I think it's to talk to the dwarves or something like that, but uh, whatever it is, they're gone forever. You will never ever see them again. I'm not entirely sure why they decided to do this. By the end of the game, I had three or four hireable NPCs just cooling their heels. One more wouldn't have hurt, would it? Maybe if they came back with information or news or an item or an artifact or something. It just feels like the game's trying to pull back your power level and it's really kind of useless. After this, we mostly move on to the next major quest, which is dealing with Mangar. This and the next two main quests both follow the same general flow. Go somewhere that's being wrecked by a resurrected boss from the original games, kill a bunch of bad guys, solve a local problem, 
obtain a reliquary for the wraith form of the boss, and then kill the boss. And then you go back to Rabi and start the next quest. So let's uh, let's take care of Mangar here. The quest itself is mostly fine. Since it's the first real quest, it's where we learn he's a wraith and we need a special item to be able to kill him. Unfortunately, learning this information is all about exploring Kyleran's tower. Kyleran's tower was annoying enough in the original, and it's really just a long series of puzzles. Pushing blocks, fiddling with cogs, timing runs down corridors, mixing ink, etc., etc., etc. It's a sign of things to come in the game. Any given puzzle, in and of itself, isn't too terribly bad. It's the totality. In total, they become a real drag. It stops being, oh, what's next? And becomes, oh god, what's next? Either way, it ends up with a sorta, kinda puzzle fight against Mangar. I, I, it's really just a matter of waiting a few turns for the NPC to finish his plot spell. It, it, it's less of a puzzle fight and more of a plot fight. Regardless, winning this fight, and hoping the game doesn't crash, moves you on to the meat of the quest, which finally lets you out of Scarabray 2.0. This has bonuses and drawbacks. On the good side, you get some very lovely scenery, new music, and a fleshing out of the world. On the bad side, you're still basically in a maze with limited paths you have to follow to progress the plot. You're outside, but it's still a dungeon crawl. You also have a lot of dead walking if you're doing any exploring at all, which again is not a major problem in and of itself, but your movement speed isn't very fast even when you're running, so at times you're just kind of running around for five or six minutes trying to find a missed path or a missed group of enemies. And with no real en random encounters, if you've cleared an area, you've got a lot of scenery to look at. The lowlands are pretty easy to get lost in, which, you know, isn't great either. It also introduces the uh, barrows, I guess. Uh, hidden places created by the new bad guys who were secretly the puppet masters all along. These barrows are emblematic of the game as a whole. Neat idea, lovely art direction, pretty good music, kind of interesting concept but poor execution. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, flesh doors. The, the doors in the place look like they're made out of flesh, like globs of fat. It's, it's really neat and exceedingly creepy. It's perfect for the theme they're going for. Likewise, the puzzles. They're these blood-powered energy things. You, you spin plates on the floor and walls to line up energy paths, kind of, kind of like a plumbing puzzle. They're pretty neat, but like everything, they quickly get excessive. You start having puzzles that span multiple rooms with dozens of plates on the floors and walls and plates that can switch on and off depending on the energy flowing into them, and you need to turn on some blood fountains and activate some orbs and some of those orbs stay active once they're turned on but others don't and need a continuous flow to keep them powered it just builds and builds and builds and quickly becomes more frustrating than anything uh, now I'll admit it's possible that I just don't have as much patience for puzzles if you love puzzles you're going to eat this stuff up believe me but while the original had puzzles in them, especially Kyleran's Tower, it wasn't at the level that this game is. This game isn't so much an RPG with puzzles as it is a puzzle game with some RPG elements. And so, after solving all of these puzzles, or like me, using Struggler's Lament to bypass the more annoying ones, you get Mangar's Reliquary which is a elven puzzle weapon. Okay. I, I'm not sure how randomized things are, but I, I, I pretty much ignored it, as I had better stuff to use. I, I didn't need a wand. Uh, not long after you get the reliquary, you uh, face off against Mangar. 
And he's kind of a punk. So back to Rabby. Next, Santa, the boss from Bard's Tale 2. It's pretty much more of the same, except the place that you're at is snowy instead of lowlandy. The layout, unfortunately, is quite a bit worse. The side quests are more annoying, and it's much easier to get lost. But again, the flow is pretty much the same. Do some little stuff, get the reliquary, kill Xanta. Now that is selling the quest short. There is some stuff to talk about, like the visuals. The snowy, the snow-covered landscape is just great. Um, the weird cargo statue with a, with a big hand that you stand on and it lifts you up to the top of a cliff, it's great. It doesn't make a lick of sense, and I'm, I'm sorry game, but hanging the lampshade yourself doesn't absolve you of making this stupid thing in the first place. Nonsensical or not, I still liked it, and occasionally would just ride the thing because the, the visuals of the transition were, were great to look at. There's also a little mini quest um, with some selkies that was very nice. I liked how alien they were made, despite the fact that they looked just like any of the other humans in the, uh, in the game. It, it was a nice nod to real-world folklore. It doesn't fit with Bard's Tale folklore, but it was still nice. Still, when I finished the quest and went back to the Jarl, I lied to him about how his son died and I returned his heirloom to him, which was another thing he had asked about. Then one of my party members popped off saying she didn't think it was the right thing to do. Really? Should I have given him the gory details about his son's pointless torture and death? Lied and kept the stupid heirloom that I didn't need in the first place? It's, it's a weird set of morals you've got there, game. I'm not sure what you were going for. And also, the very obvious traitor, what turns out to be a traitor, never gets his comeuppance. He just vanishes from the game. I mean, unless he was in one of the fights sporting a non-unique model and I killed him without noticing. It, it, it seems kind of a weird loose thread. Whatever. Back to Rabby. Next is Tarjan. Oof. There are some issues with this quest, and I will admit that I am going to be more persnickety because Bard's Tale 3 is my favorite game of the series. It's the one I've played the most. But it has issues. And, and not just because it's the same path flow as the previous two quests. It's also back in the lowlands again because I, I guess they ran out of location ideas. The, the twist here though is uh, that you need to get an artifact called the Hungering Blade in order to access Tarjan's reliquary. Okay. But it does lead to some issues with the final fight against Tarjan. You see, Tarjan has this death orb thing that more or less makes him invincible and you need to kill the orb first, which is fine. However, the game has taught me that simply owning the quest item was sufficient. I didn't wield the reliquaries when I fought the previous two bosses, just having them in my inventory was enough. Not so with Tarjan. Some poor bastard actually has to wield the Hungering Blade. Furthermore, you have to use the special attacks that the blade gives you to do damage. So if you've got another attack, like Head Knocker or something, that's not going to do anything. You have to use the Hungering Blade special attack. So, after a few rounds of beating up on a glowing orb, then you can kick Tarjan's ass. And he's also kind of a punk. Uh, let's back up a little, though, because Tarjan is very chatty. So he has a lot of speechifying before the combat, and then plenty of yakking after the fight starts before you can do anything. You cannot skip this. So if you need to do the fight again, say because the game crashed, or because you didn't have the Harrowing Blade equipped, you get to watch it all over again. Come on, in exile, let us skip the cutscenes. Also, side thing, uh, what's the point of Existential Crisis, the unfinished Dwarven Blade? I had assumed it was going to be used to make the Harrowing Blade, because it's a quest item, but I never did anything with it, and I never found a place to use it. 
did I skip over that step uh, in a puzzle because I used Struggler's Lament? Did I miss a side path? I'd go back and check, but there was no hard save, and grabbing the Harrowing Blade locks you into the end game. Oh well, if you know what it's for, leave a note in the comments. And uh, once you're locked into that end game, you've really only got two options and two places where you can fast travel the end game zone and Harrenhold. So let's briefly touch on Harrenhold, which is uh, apparently in Canestia. Uh -huh. Even though on the map it looks like it's just on an island off the coast of Scarabray 2.0. Either way, it really feels like a post-game dungeon, like one of the old SSI Dave's dungeons. Uh, but there's no post-game, so personally I did it right before the final fight. In general, Harrenhold is much like the rest of the game. Pretty, nice music, poor execution. The puzzles quickly grew pretty tiring. They were kind of a greatest hits of previous puzzles. The fights were pretty challenging, but ultimately largely the same thing done five times with varying degrees of difficulty. However, I really did like the story, what little there was, and the resolution was very nice. It was a nice little scene there at the end. I kind of wonder who wrote it. Since nobody was a ridiculous caricature and the dwarves' face, faith was treated with respect, I can only assume it wasn't Nathan. Uh, however, <clears throat> whoever designed the red cap deserves to be chucked off a bridge. For one thing, that wasn't red cap. A weird creature that runs around on four legs spewing poison is not red cap. I mean, you guys know that red cap was an individual and there's an actual description of him, right? I mean, he was humanoid. He was an old guy that would trick travelers and then kill them when their guard was down and soak his hat in their blood. Red Cap? It's kind of hard to trick travelers into letting down their guard when you're a horrifying spindly monster thing. Surely you could have given it another name. A better name. Second, the fight with the Red Cap was kind of a jerk move. I mean, the fight is easily the hardest in the game. It strikes from ambush when you're leaving. It's a real pain in the neck, brutally difficult, and even without it healing 700 health points when a character dies. I basically spent all of my time hitting it with bleed and poison, forcing it to move to proc the bleed, and then madly healing my character. Tough fights are good, but it's very easy to cross over into annoying or frustrating, and this creature crosses the line in my mind. My party was level 28, and on easy difficulty, and that fight was a nightmare. I, I can't imagine on a hardcore difficulty level. Well, seeing as how we've uh, moved on to page 5 of this script, I, I'm should be less verbose and get things in gear, so let's move on to the endgame quest. To the surprise of absolutely nobody, Yadis, the main villain, has been masquerading as a high-ranking priestess in the Fatherite Order. <gasps> so you fight through Scarabray 2.0 that's now on fire, and that wasn't too bad. I just wish I could have actually helped people instead of talking to ghosts telling me about how cartoonishly evil the paladins were. You fight your way to the temple, and then suddenly a whole bunch of people show up to secure the perimeter. Okay. Thanks for the help, guys. Oh, and the weird farmer NPC who crop pops up every now and then and says three things to you gives you those three things. Quality payoff, guys. Good job. The final zone, the midden, is just more puzzles. Of course. Some of them are fine, and some of them are excessive, which is the story of the game. Nothing new there. There are, however, a bunch of dwarven chests scattered about, so I hope you did handhold for those powerful weapons. I also hope you like overly complicated spinning cog puzzles. 
seriously, who built a 30-foot-tall cog puzzle underneath the city? Uh, up until now, I've been sprinkling plenty of spoilers throughout this video, but we're coming up on major endgame spoilers. But if you've made it this far, I assume you don't really care, so let's plunge ahead. So, as I understand it, in order to keep the farm here, the bad guys from the long, long ago, to keep them out, the elves and dwarves of yore sealed a rift in order to keep it sealed, they had some lady, the maiden, sing. They also seemed to have put a protective bubble around the maiden and set a whole bunch of traps and puzzles that Yadis was able to pass through like a ghost, leaving them for me to solve, because she's waiting there for you at the end. So somehow she got past them and reset them all. Anyway, Yadis needs the blood of a descendant of the maiden, so I guess she's some sort of niece, unless Nathan just doesn't know what maiden means, uh, in order to pop the bubble to f kill the maiden to free the farm here. Right. So. The party walks up, and you initiate a cutscene. Clara, the descendant, gets knifed and killed by Yadis, so I guess that Find Clara side quest was just a big tease. Then all of Yadis's flunkies die to power the spell, and they pop the bubble, and Yadis kills the maiden. I think, at least. We don't actually see that. The bubble pops, and the maiden's gone, so maybe she popped with it. Uh, I would have thought the heroes were, would intervene, since they were standing right there, but I, I guess not. Uh, then Yadis zombifies her flunkies, with a kind of nice line of something along the lines of uh, death is no excuse not to serve. I liked that. Uh, and then it's time for the final fight. Which is kind of annoying, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the scrubs are scrubs and no big deal, except that they get the first turn and two or three of them have stunning attacks. Uh, then you move on to the second stage with Yadis, which at first confused me, but I've since replayed it and I see what's going on. On her first turn, Yadis summons something called a primeval portal, and if you leave that portal alone, it will gate in a Herald of the Fam here. Uh, that's a very, very bad thing. The Herald has no health bar, so you have no idea how much health it has and if it's close to death or not. Oh, and it also casts a Mangar's Mallet-like spell that nukes the entire party every single round. It's pretty awful, and it's really easy to overlook the stupid thing because it's a black and purple swirl of smoke that really blends into the black and purple swirling background. Luckily, uh, if you do plan things out, you can kill Yadis before the Herald appears, and that will end the fight. Unluckily, if the Herald does show up, you do need to kill him, and with the no health bar, that makes it difficult. Or at least kind of annoying. Um, on my first playthrough, my, I had one fighter that barely survived and did the final blow for the final cutscene. Anyway, after that, we move on to our final choice. I think it was supposed to be a, a, a Sophie's Choice type thing that was very, that's difficult and hard for the player to make. You see, while the rift has been sealed, the Fam here, doing their best Gog Magog, will continue to claw at our reality trying to break in, and eventually they will break through unless someone sings the rift closed again. So, the party must choose. Option one is Fiona. While I haven't mentioned her before, she's a bard that you picked up much earlier in the game, I believe in the Mangar quest line. And personally, she'd been in my party constantly since I picked her up. So, her skills were sculpted by me, and she in fact was the one who I selected to get the priest skills. So while I didn't create her, by the end she was very much my character, as much mine as anyone else. Or I could choose Rabbi. Yeah, that's, that's not a hard choice. 
And then the elves erase everyone's memory of everything that happened. No, seriously. To keep anyone from finding the midden and to keep the farm here out, the elves and dwarves cast some major spell to completely erase everyone's memory of what happened and of the midden. What a completely ridiculous and idiotic ending. It erases everything we've done. And what about all the people who had family die? Gee, what happened to Bob? I don't know. He's gone. Nathan, you're a hack. Now, I know earlier I said I'd touch on combat after the quests, but we're going to mix things up and just go right into talking about the lore and story since we're here. Briefly, the lore has been totally screwed. Turning Mangar, Xanta, and Tarjan into whining, complaining wraiths is just the beginning. Not only are all three almost entirely interchangeable in how they act and talk, they all look identical. As in, they all use the same game model. I'm always loath to psychoanalyze people online, but I can't help but feel this is intentional. Much of the game feels like an attempt to lift up Barrow's Deep by pushing down on what came before. Not only are the old bosses just flunkies to be dispatched, they're whiny flunkies. We're only a step or two above the Three Stooges. Making them all look the same is just another way to blank them out and make them unimportant. Unlike Yadis, who is a mastermind, who has two world-powerful sorcerers and a god who are working for and taking orders from her. Speaking of Tarjan being a god, well, maybe he isn't anymore. There's this whole all-war thing that happened a long time ago. No idea when. Uh, before the first game. A really long time ago. And according to the new lore, all the gods died fighting the Fom here because they're the real bad guys, unlike those saps from the original games. So, what was Tarjan? What were uh, Ferrofist or Skadu or Wera? It seems like Nathan's trying to imply that they weren't really gods because the real gods all died in the All War. But what about the heroes of the realms that were turned into gods after Bard's Tale 3? Are they not real gods? Are, are they off somewhere else? Are they uninterested in doing something from Scarabray, despite the lore saying that twice they saved Scarabray? Do you only get two? And what about the old man? You telling me that he wasn't interested? You know, the guy that couldn't die and who could turn people into gods? He wasn't a god either? Are we just retconning everything out of Bard's Tale 3 except for a few name drops? Also, you took the time to bring back Sulphur Springs, of all things, but it's not connected to the Tarjan quest in any way. Really? You have Mangar connected to Sulphur Springs and Tarjan to this new Red Vault. Come on, guys. The excuse this game seems to want to rest on is that it's been 150 years since the events of Bard's Tale 3. And I'm sorry, but that's just a weak excuse. I mean, you'd think the appearance of seven new constellations in the sky would be something that someone might have made note of and remembered. But really, 150 years isn't that long, especially when you have races that have been alive. Dwarves, elves, and gnomes are all traditionally long-lived races. Granted, sometime in the past 150 years, gnomes have apparently vanished from the world, but uh, the other two are still there. So how long ago is 150 years, anyway? Well, in our world, here's some highlights from 1869. Ulysses S. Grant was sworn in as president. Purdue University in Indiana was founded. 
the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, Gandhi and Neville Peace in Our Time, Chamberlain, were both born, and in 1876, 143 years ago, the Chicago Cubs helped to found the National League. So while 150 years is long compared to the lifespan of a single human being, it's not that long for humanity. I mean, how hard would it have been to make it 500 years? Or, or 1,000? Scarra Bray in the real world is over 5,000 years old. Damascus, Byblos, and Thebes are all almost that old in the 3,000 range, and they're still occupied to this day. The town I live in is 80 years old, and the city it's a suburb of is 167 years old. And I'm in the United States. I, I, I'm kind of rambling here, but my, my point is 150 years isn't long enough to forget the events of 1, 2, and 3. And that's not even dealing with the fact that there are numerous people knocking around who remember 150 years ago because they were there in the prime of their life, and they're still in the prime of their life. And yes, I'm harping on this, but it's something that really kind of aggravates me and leads to some of my complaints that this game is really kind of just Bard's Tale in name only. And sadly, I, I have to come down on the side of this not being a faithful entry in the series. Sure, it's a party-based RPG. Yes, there's dungeon crawling. Yes, there's bards. But beyond that? Beyond that, it's just name-dropping. Uh, what in this game's version of Mangar links him at all to Bard's Tale aside from his name? I mean, his tower was pretty cool looking, but it doesn't really match the original or, you know, physical space. He doesn't look anything like he did in the originals. And the same thing goes for Xanta and Tarji. Scarabray in the originals was in the middle of a valley surrounded by grassland. Now it's next to the sea. And it's been rotated, 90 degrees. Are things like this intentional slights? Errors out of ignorance? Just a lack of caring? I I'm really not sure what, which is worse, but they're all failing. Uh, there's plenty of things name-checked from the previous games, but that, that doesn't really add anything. Y'all remember the movie about a decade ago, I, Robot? Well, they had a script for a movie called Hardwired. Then afterwards, they secured the rights to iRobot from the Asimov estate, so they changed the title, changed a couple names, tweaked a couple things, and made their movie and called it iRobot. And it's generally regarded as one of the worst adaptations ever made. Simply name-checking stuff from your source doesn't make your project faithful. Knock it off. Clearly you guys were more interested in making Barrows Deep than Bard's Tale 4. That ain't rain in exile, don't lie to me. And for the love of God, quit hiring Nathan to write your sequels. Let him stick to his Warhammer novels, because pretty clearly hates Bard's Tale. Okay, alright. Enough. Uh, I, I could go on for hours about this, but I'm... I think I've made myself clear, so let's get into the home stretch of this thing and, and, and talk about the combat and bugs. There's a lot of little bugs and annoyances in the game, and many of them come out in combat. However, the biggest bug is the continual crashes to desktop. I've been told that the next patch is supposed to deal with it, but you know, the base version of Barrow's Deep came out last year, and the director's cut has been out since August. It's an awfully long time for such a major problem to exist. Essentially, when you're playing the game, about every hour or two, the game will crash to the desktop. No warning, just a little box saying there's been a fatal error. Or sometimes it just CTDs. It largely looks to be like the engine crashing and burning, but it's hard to tell. An unexpected CTD is bad enough, but when you have it in a game with checkpoint saving, it's an all-hands-on-deck sort of thing. 
if you're going to play this game, you really, really, really should turn on Save Anywhere until this is fixed. Yes, it makes the game easier, and yes, it locks you out of some experience from sacrificing save totems, but until this game is fixed, it's nearly unplayable otherwise. Because it's not just when the game's been running too long. There was a section towards the middle where I had three crashes in a row. Luckily, I figured out how to solve the problem by not playing the game the rest of the night and coming back the next day. Another crash seemed to be related to Archmage robes. No, I have no idea why, but every single time I tried to equip them, the game would lock up. And by lock up, I mean it basically turned into a screenshot and needed to be closed via the task manager. Nice. Aside from that, let's talk about some minor bugs, which means we're gonna talk about combat. In general, Combat is actually okay. I really didn't think I would like it, but as much as I hate to admit it, I really kind of did. In general, it scales well with level. While some enemies are really just massive bullet sponges where there's very little strategy, it generally works right. And there's plenty of skills that can help mitigate those bullet sponges too. Fire, poison, and bleeding all do damage scaling based on level, So there's and there's multiple ways to strip armor from enemies. And then you just stack all that stuff to really great effect. Yes, it means a lot of enemy juggling and micromanaging, but it keeps the fights engaging. And that being said, while it's good that at-level or above-level fights are engaging, it also means that even walk-in-the-park-easy fights are still involved. When I'm fighting level 1 scrubs with my level 20 brute squad, why do I still need to juggle enemies and plot everything out? The combat does a really good job of scaling up, but it doesn't really scale down. And this does not hold true for enemies. When the enemy majorly outclasses the party, it will completely wipe the floor with you while you are completely unable to do damage. Why can't I kick around the scrubs that easily? One of the things they talked about pre-release was that you could queue up mute moves so that you didn't have to wait for animations and such. You know, keep the game moving along at a rapid pace if you wanted. Well, sort of. You can queue up a couple moves, but any more than three or four, and the game just grinds. I believe it takes longer to run through queued moves than it would to just do them one right after the other. Especially when you consider that damage over time effects generally trigger during the transition from one turn to the other. It wouldn't be unusual for me to have eight effects all trying to fire off between rounds, even without me adding more. My mage's meditation channel ends, adding spell points. The bard's points, spell points song channel ends, adding more spell points. Rain of arrow triggers and can cause damage across three different squares. Two or more characters have fire damage trigger. One character has poison trigger, and this really causes the game to grind. And on more than one occasion, had me worried that the game had crashed. I'd rather have to slow down a little than just sit there and watch my computer chug. I'd rather have to wait to select skills than as opposed to having the game seize up on me. Also, it would be nice if dead enemies wouldn't just sort of stand around like they were valid targets when they really weren't. Uh, a couple other issues uh, involve Mean Drunk, Mangar's Mallet, and Guarded. Because of the cooldown refreshes, you can sometimes have a character drink twice in one combat round, but it seems like Mean Drunk, which does minor damage to the enemy after you drink, will only trigger once. It's not an issue that much, but there's nothing in the skill description to tell you this. Mangar's Mallet is a large area of effect spell that does mental damage. Uh, mental damage can screw with people when they're trying to channel abilities, like gathering spell points is great. Except, for some reason, Mangar's Mallet doesn't do that. 
While the game considers it mental damage for things like enemies who resist or are immune to mental damage, it doesn't consider it mental damage when it comes to interrupting channeled abilities. But at least it doesn't get mitigated by armor, so it's in this weird quasi-in-between state. Uh, finally, Guarded. Uh, guarded is a passive ability that fighters can get that funnels damage from nearby characters to the tank. So those characters will take less damage because they're being guarded by the tank. Great, except it doesn't work right when you've got a character that has no armor. Those characters still seem to take most of the damage from an attack, which means the characters that need guarded the most benefit the least. My second fighter with 30 armor really doesn't need more damage mitigation. My noodly wizard with zero armor on the other hand desperately needs it. Oh, also summon herb doesn't work, but summoning is completely useless, so I doubt anybody's actually noticed or cares. Finally, the way channeling abilities work is not very well planned. See, channeled abilities are very important in this game. Wizards use Meditate to gain spell points, and that's a channeled ability. Bards singing a spell to give people spell points is a channeled ability. And so is the shield stance. You see, fighters can enter a stance that raises their armor class. With the right kind of shield, they can stay in that stance for free. Great. Right. Another fighter skill is called All Together, and this is a focus ability that gives that bonus armor to every adjacent character. Great! But everyone who gets that bonus is now using a focused ability, which means they can't use a channeled ability. My wizard could really use that armor, but if he can't gain spell points, he's useless. Moreover, I can't have my wizard stop that armor focus. The only way to stop it is to have the fighter that's using the skill stop using the skill, which means everybody loses the bonus. It's an understandable but very frustrating mechanic, especially when you first learn about it in the middle of a really tough fight. I don't know if it was intentional or an oversight. And, like so many things, it really is a reflection of the game as a whole. I have said several times throughout this review that things are very good on the micro, but frustrating or annoying on the macro. And that's the best description of the game I can think of. Borrows Deep really is less than the sum of its parts, and that's too bad. It could have been a good game, but the bugs and design choices really hinder it. Each little thing is stretched out too much, and stuff quickly goes from enjoyable to tedious, engaging to dull, exciting to tiresome. As an RPG, Borrows Deep is average. The director's cut adding Save Anywhere and Struggler's Lament goes a long way to making the game better. Once the, game, once the bugs are finally patched, it would be a very solid AA title. Unfortunately, it has a AAA price tag, and I don't think it's there. If you want a puzzle-heavy RPG, grab it on sale. If you want a Bard's Tale game, buy the Chrome Remaster. <laughs>